Derek Gilbert and I predicted some things years ago in our book, uh, The Day the Earth Stands Still, and a lot of that stuff is coming to pass today. We're going to examine how that applies today. All that and more on today's Into the Multiverse. This is Into the Multiverse with Josh Peck. Uh, so we got a lot to get to today. There's a lot of stories, a lot of recent stories that have come out. There has recently been a strange face found uh, on in, in Antarctica. It, this it, it's it's weird because it's similar to the face that was found on Mars, but uh, this is found in Antarctica. Now I have to warn you: in this article, they do call uh, people who believe that this is an ancient structure, you know, they, they, they throw around terms like conspiracy nuts or wackos or, you know, all, all this stuff. So uh, j- just wanted to warn you about that. This comes from the sun, but, um, and they, they clearly don't seem to be any friend to conspiracy theorists because of how they talk about them in here. But uh, the title is Google Earth Uncovers Enormous Alien Face in Antarctica and Conspiracy Nuts. I don't think they're nuts, but they, uh, they think it's the work of a hidden civilization. Um, so in this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but if we scroll down here, you can see it right here. Very strange looking thing. UFO hunters say they found signs of an alien invasion in Google Earth snaps of Antarctica. The conspiracy nuts reckon they've found a grimacing face carved in the ice at a remote region in the southeast of the island. You can see it right there. Um, notorious Instagram account UFO Scandinavia uploaded strange footage last week showing the bizarre anomaly. It shows a man zooming in and out of a satellite snap on Google Earth. The snow in view appears to have the shape of eyes, a nose, and a mouth, the mouth which appears to be contorted in a terrifying grimace. The image sparked a frenzy online, some claiming it's evidence of a hidden civilization. So again, you can take a look at it there. That's what it looks like. Uh, does It does look like a face. Here's where the... Here's where the anomaly was, was spotted, and of course they, they, you know, on this website they just can't help but to keep saying over and over again conspiracy nuts. Uh, but here's Australia, here's Antarctica. There's um, so you can kind of see there. Uh, so once again, bonkers conspiracy theorists have long claimed that an ancient civilization, possibly of alien origin, lived or still lives under the Antarctic ice. Conspiracy theorists uh, Blake and Brett Cousins of YouTube channel Third Phase of Moon shared their thoughts on the Google Earth image. Quote, it appears to be a massive alien structure of some kind of face that is being revealed for the first time on Google Earth, uh, Blake said in his video. I would, have, I would have to concur that whatever we're looking at resembles some sort of mega structure. Brett added, could this be something that was left behind by ancient civilizations of Antarctica? Ice melting could be revealing structures that would baffle the world. Around 90,000 people have watched the original Instagram footage of the Antarctic face. Uh, one user says that that's not a natural thing. That Mother Nature made by wind and cold looks like a Viking metal helmet with nose piece running down the upper part. So again, you can kind of, it, it does sort of look like that. And, you know, of course there have been, for quite some time, there have been stories of uh, underground civilizations and, and, and even giant races uh, under the ice in Antarctica. Uh, and actually... Uh, one thing that I can show you here, an interview right here on Into the Multiverse with uh, Justin Fall about the Hollow Earth theory. He, he had a film out, the Hollow Earth Chronicles, uh, he and his brother Wes, and we interviewed Justin and he talked about some of the strange things having to do with Antarctica. Watch this. Admiral Byrd is a, a legend, okay? Admiral Byrd is an American legend. Uh, many people call him a hero. He was a polar logistics guy. He was uh, an admiral, a polar explorer first guy to fly over the North and South Poles. Admiral Byrd was a major player in the exploration of the North and South Poles for the United States of America. So we're not just dealing with some guy that just popped up overnight. Admiral Byrd was taken down into the hollow earth by UFOs that were donning Nazi symbols. He, he was really highly regarded by the government. He right. was the guy that would come out and tell the public the public version of what the government was doing, right? right. He would give them the official right, story right. of why we're going to the North Pole, why we're going to the South Pole, and he is one of four people to wear a medal with his own face on it. Right. 
that doesn't happen. Okay, that's that's unheard Not of. Not often. Right. You've got two post commemorative postage stamps with Admiral Byrd on them. You've got tons of literature put out by the government praising Admiral Byrd, okay? Right. You've got replica maps of his journeys. When he comes out and he says that he's experienced some of these things, and it was on his deathbed nonetheless, uh -huh. mm. that's what we see a lot of times with these guys who are, you know, they're major players in some of these government operations. They have a lot of secrets they're holding on to, and it's, it's in that moment before death where they start questioning what they've been fighting for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And for him, he'd been holding all of these secrets, secrets about what happened in Antarctica, secrets about what took place at the North Pole, secrets that he was told he could never tell a soul about. And so on his deathbed, it's believed that this diary that came out, it was handed off to the right people mm -hmm. towards the end of his life so that his story could be shared with the world. Now, what's, what's interesting is that on his deathbed, he explains that he was always good and he always kept his mouth shut. Hmm. I was a good soldier. I did my duty. Mm -hmm. He also warns us of the military industrial complex, which is taking over. And he blames the industrial, the military industrial complex for the silencing of the truth. Oh, wow. That's, That's interesting. interesting. That, that yes. was, and, and look, to, to mention the military industrial complex in 1947, I'd say that's pretty mm -hmm. prophetic. That's almost. before Eisenhower mentioned it. Exactly. So Bird knew what he was doing. Uh, Admiral Bird says that he was flying over the North Pole. But interestingly, Bird gets over there. He's flying over the North Pole. He's got a cameraman with him. He called him his radio guy. But, mm -hmm. you know, in those yeah. days, you kind of do whatever, whatever you can. <clears throat> They're flying over the North Pole. All of a sudden, the temperature starts getting warm. Which makes no sense. No. It's the North Pole, well, right? Mm-hmm. Temperature starts getting warm. He sees a mountain range that he's never seen before. Now, Bird is on record as flying over the North Pole even back in 1929. This is important to note. Oh, that's early. Yes. Very early. And uh, multiple flyovers of the North Pole. Now, the original flyover, it was not quite as in-depth as what we're about to talk about. But he's on record as flying over back in government records, 1929. Uh, some believe that there was also a 28, but I believe they're just preparing. I think there's just... Terminology gets confused sometimes, but on record flying in 1929. And what blew my mind is he's flying over it. And, and he says, I see a change of atmosphere and I see a mountain range and there's greenery. Oh, now, why? we're not talking about ice and snow anymore. Now, wow. in, in the beginning of his flight log, and see, he gives you the flight log with the timestamps. And he says, ice and snow below. You're following the man on his journey. Mm -hmm. It's an adventure. You're following him. You're in the plane with him. And all of a sudden, there's deciduous forests. But here's what's really crazy. It's now about 74 degrees. There's no more ice and snow. There's running water. There's tropical deciduous forest all around. Mm -hmm. And he sees what looks like an elephant. And he says, going lower, decreasing altitude to take a better look. He says, it is a mammoth. Oh, my goodness. Not an elephant. We're talking about a mammoth who, at this point in history, would have been extinct. My goodness. He keeps flying. He's reporting all this back to base camp, but then his radio starts messing up. He loses control of his airplane because two UFOs, all we could explain them as is flying discs, mm -hmm. come up, one on each side of his plane. They say, don't worry, Admiral. They call him by name. They're talking through to his radio. They say, we are in control now. He loses total control of his plane. He's just, at this point, you just sit back. It's like one of those rides at Disneyland ah. where it doesn't matter if you steer, it doesn't matter, your car is going to go on the same track. They take him down into a very strange entrance. And it's almost like an elevator system, the way that he's landed. They get out, they approach him, and he's keeping a log of all this. They take him down, they say, the master requires your attention. The master. Oh, they call creepy. him the master. So he goes down into the earth, and it's technology. It's an emerald city, pretty much. It's a whole underground, extra-dimensional city. And he says there's, there, there's things that he sees that no one of his day has ever talked about. Mm. Did they tell him that he was now underground within the earth? Or did there, he just there, assume there, that? No, no, there's a portion of it where it comes out, and he even talks about you're in the realm. Get this. I'm probably giving away too much here, but I'm an information guy. I just want the information uh -huh. out there. When the master's talking to him, he says, you are in the domain 
of the Ariani. Oh. Now, I'm thinking Ariani, Anunnaki, Ariani, Anunnaki. Kind of an interesting word choice, right? Yeah. But he's on this, this, this belt. It's like a conveyor belt that's taking him to the master. And then there's this elevator system where he descends, but when the door opens, he says that there's no sound. We're dealing with unbelievable technology for 1947. Mm -hmm. He's in the, the, the realm of the Ariani, the domain of the Ariani, meeting with an entity known as the Master. And he explains that he has the best interest of our race of course. at heart. Now, he refers to your race, your race, Admiral, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. your race has done. And what's interesting about that is it's kind of putting the cards out to where he understands that human race is not what the master is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not dealing with homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with something totally different. Mm -hmm. The Ariani, the Arians, mm -hmm. you know, which again, we do believe that the Anunnaki are the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It all lines up together. It meshes so beautifully. And Admiral Byrd is just sitting there taking it all in. And he warns him about how our race had been tampering with weapons of mass destruction. So it's very strange. It seems like something is going on. We'll just have to keep our eyes on these stories and see. Next, speaking of uh, other planets and possible life, uh, ancient Mars apparently was warm and rainy enough to support life. And this is interesting because it kind of tracks along with some of uh, David Flynn's research. He, he had an idea uh, that Mars may have been populated by angelic civilizations in the, in the ancient, ancient, ancient past. So th this news coming out now is, is pretty interesting. We'll, bri we'll, we'll touch on it briefly, but also our good friend Tim Alberino, uh, previously on Multiverse, found something interesting on Mars. So we're, we'll get to that in a minute. But first it says, it's long been established that Mars once had water on its surface, but a new study suggests that between three and four billion years ago, the red planet was warm and wet enough to have massive rainstorms and flowing water an environment that may have supported life. The new study presented at Goldschmidt Geochemistry Conference in Barcelona compares mineral deposit patterns on Mars with those seen on Earth to support the hypothesis. Uh, so Purdue University professor Bryony Horgan said in a statement, quote, we know there were periods when the surface of Mars was frozen. We know there were periods when water flowed freely, end quote. Uh, so here's a picture. This is the site of the Mars 2020 landing, a chemical alteration by water. Uh, so on ancient Mars, water covered channels and transportation uh, tran and transported sediments to uh, form fans and deltas within lake basins. So color enhanced to show mineral types. So you can see that there. Uh, so Horgan continued, quote, but we don't know exactly when these periods were and how long they lasted. We have never sent unmanned missions to areas of Mars, which can show us these earliest rocks. So we need to use earthbound science to understand the geochemistry of what might have happened there. Our study of weathering in radically different climate conditions, such as the Oregon Cascades, Hawaii, Iceland, and other places on Earth can show us how climate affects pattern of mineral uh, de deposition, like what we see, like we see on Mars. Uh, so it continues, it continues uh, on after that. It really gets into the science of how they discovered this. But if that is true, uh, is it possible that what David Flynn was saying was correct? Is there actual evidence of ancient civilizations on Mars? Well, uh, my lovely, beautiful wife, Christina, and I, we interviewed Timothy Alberino uh, a couple of years ago on uh, what, what he said was a, a Morse code that was found on Mars, and it, it falls right in line with this question. So watch this. NASA released a photo, very unusual photo, of the surface of Mars under the heading Morse code on Mars. Mm. And the media ran with this story uh, as, if, uh, as if they were instructed to run with this story under the heading of Morse code on Mars, and they made a big deal about it, uh, wondering is, uh, is this image that NASA released, this image here, which I have a mm -hmm. file for you to put on screen yeah. of it, um, is this representative of some kind of numerical language such as Morse code. Mm -hmm. Now, it was stated tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. both by NASA and then uh, by, the, uh, by the media uh, outlets, many of the major media outlets that ran this story. 
And even in NASA's own article, if you go to NASA's website, you'll see the heading Morse code on Mars, and then you'll read the article where they basically debunk the idea that this is Morse code on Mars. So, so they what, put forth the idea, and then, and then they, they go and, they, and, and they proceed own. to debunk it and say, no, this is just the result of wind patterns and the natural formation of the sand and so forth, mm. which uh, doesn't really make a difference mm -hmm. in the overarching, uh, the overarching point that I want to make, which is these, this so-called Morse, Morse code on Mars is analogous with what is known as the geoglyphs of Tiwanaku. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you and Steve covered in uh, True Legends, the, the first one, Technology that's right. of the Fallen. Right, based on an article written by David Flynn in mm -hmm. 2012, entitled Geoglyph, The Geoglyphs of Tiwanaku, uh, which Tom Horn commented out in the, in, in, in the book, uh, The David Flynn Collection. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Tom's comment was right. He said something to the effect that this is one of the most astounding discoveries made in the modern era concerning something that could potentially be very ancient. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agreed with that, uh, with Tom's assessment of what David Flynn discovered, looking using um, uh, using a satellite imagery that was just coming online at the time, uh, the, the high resolution stuff. Uh, he discovered these geoglyphs and what they are. Uh, are raised ridge lines mm -hmm. and also I'm sorry not ridge lines they're raised they're lines that are raised uh, and with with the the earth like as if they were um, uh, constructed uh, lines and dots and hills on the surface of the earth but also dug into the bedrock hmm. of the earth so you have these lines that are both uh, raised mounds and also um, uh, the, dug into the bedrock forming these very intricate and interesting shapes mm -hmm. and dots. So completely different than what we would see, say, at like the Sahara Desert or something. Uh, yeah. Just from wind patterns. Very different. Wow. Yeah. Normally, like, if you look at uh, wind patterns in, 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 the, in the desert, they're going to look wavy. Right. Depending on which way the wind is blowing, which is exactly what you see in the ocean and so forth. Mm -hmm. When you have wind movement, uh, you have usually a uniform direction that things are moving in. Um, so... It, it, it's very unlikely that that these that these patterns that we see on the surface of Mars, whether they're sand or something else, are natural. Right. And it's it's very likely in my mind that they are in fact artificial. Mm -hmm. That they were created, especially when you compare them with the geoglyphs of Tiwanaku in Bolivia, mm -hmm. which of course nobody has. Right. So, and, and I'm speaking in terms of the mainstream media, and uh, uh, and of NASA themselves. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's bizarre when you compare the two, when you compare the geoglyphs of Tiwanaku with the, the image that came out uh, from NASA of Mars. You may be looking at, it's very possible that you're looking at the same language, the same code. Mm. Is it some kind of a numerical, numerical code like Morse code? We believe it is, and that's what um, we postulated in our, the first episode of our documentary series, True Legends. Wow. wow. Now, now, does the, the what was found in Bolivia, does that represent any kind of known code or no or nothing any kind known of repet repetition. nothing known but we but we have a feeling and so did david flynn that it might be akin to the the language that the uh the the only form of written language that the inca had which was called quipus it wasn't really written it was a series of 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 uh, beads and strings hmm. And, and it was very intricate form of communication. I mean, mm -hmm. they could have the history of kings and the lineage of kings, and you know, on this on a string with. So it's like a string with other strings attached to it at varying lengths and knots and beads. Hmm. Usually knots, but also beads and 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 it, so it was a form of numeric language. Oh wow! Kipus wow. was, um, and not only Kipus. Uh, there's another. Uh, there's something else that's associated with Kipus, and it, the, the name of it escapes me. But it, it's it's again from the Inca, the, 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 which I think the Inca were given that knowledge, and they were using a language that existed um, uh, before they invented it so to speak so mm -hmm. so this other this other form of calculating by the inca involves squares and dots hmm. which is exactly wow. if, you, if you combine quipus which is the ropes and the knots and the beads and so forth with the the other form of the mathematical calculations that the inca were making using this this series of squares and dots and mm -hmm. um, there were beads um, um, like marbles almost squares and marbles mm -hmm. you put them together and that appears to be what is represented in both the bolivian geoglyphs of tiwanaku and the the so-called morse code on mars so really interesting stuff we're going to have to keep our eye on mars and see what uh, see what, what, what news develops because it does seem like there was something strange going on there in the ancient past. I don't know exactly what, but it's definitely interesting. There's been a recent study that 
shows some exoplanets may have greater variety of life than exists on Earth. Now, keep in mind, it says may. There, you'll see this a lot in these types of exoplanet stories. May have life, could contain, you know, it's always may, coulds, uh, you know, w- wishes and everything. So it says that a new study indicates that some exoplanets may have better conditions for life to thrive than Earth itself. Again, it's not a stunning revelation to say that something may be something else. It's not a stunning finding and a big surprise that this study finds that exoplanets may have better conditions for life than Earth. They may not. You know, what's, what's the difference? Uh, and you see that a lot in these types of articles. But it, it makes you wonder, why do they push this exoplanet question so hard? You know, they're really big into this. We'll read a little bit more of this article before getting to to the clip where uh, we actually talk about this, but it says, the discovery of exoplanets has accelerated the search for life outside our solar system. The huge distances to these exoplanets mean they are effectively impossible to reach with space probes, so scientists are working with remote sensing tools such as telescopes to understand what conditions prevail on different exoplanets. Making sense of these remote observations require the development of sophisticated models for planetary climate and evolution to allow scientists to recognize which of these distant planets might uh, host life. So again, why are they pushing this exoplanet thing so hard all the time? It's because it's it's another uh, way to inject the idea of cosmic plurality into the culture. It's another way for people to start thinking about the possibility of alien life again. And actually, Derek Gilbert and I talked about this. Um, we talked about this when our book, The Day the Earth Stands Still, came out. And this is a clip from, uh, from an episode of Skywatch TV that we did where we talk about uh, exoplanets and the connection to Leviathan in the Bible. Watch this. But what's interesting about uh, going to kind of perceptions in, in pop culture, uh, in the science realm, uh, one, of, one of the biggest ones is the search for exoplanets. Mm-hmm. Um, most recently, the, the TRAPPIST system that they, that they found. Right. Uh, but yeah, they, they actually do look for water before anything else, um, and they look at the position, uh, what's called like the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone, which, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean there's life or there could be life. Technically, Venus is in the habitable zone. Yeah. And as we talked about before, nothing is going to be living there. Um, but uh, there's actually, a, they've, they've, they've discovered a bunch of these. On, in, the, uh, in the Extrasolar Planets Encyclopedia, uh, it, it's a catalog, and it boasts uh, uh, 3,640 planets, um, 2,730 planetary systems and 612 multiple planet systems that have been discovered. So this isn't just every once in a while they find something. Like there's a lot of these things out there, uh, and they they do try they try to detect water whenever they get some kind of sign that, and, and we've even seen this with uh, uh, attempting to find water on Mars even. Whenever there's a possibility they might have found it, it blows up in the news. Now sometimes later it's proven to be something else <laughs> and then sometimes it, it you know it's just kind of left ambiguous but it always brings up this question uh, again uh, where you know people who might be drawn more to pop culture they they get this question through things like ancient aliens well more science-minded people will get it through the discovery of an exoplanet it always brings up the question could life exist on another planet does it is 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 this evidence saying it's more reasonable to believe that mm-hmm. it does and a lot of them will gravitate towards that which you know that that's fine. People can believe what they want to believe, but again, it's the severe lack of evidence. <laughs> um, it's really difficult to detect water on you know another. Pl- I mean, think about Mars. It's like how close that is compared to uh, an exoplanet on some other you know another solar system, another uh, uh, star system. Even on Mars, it can't really be proven. There's a, there's a lot of evidence saying that there likely is water there, and. Some would say that it's proven. I, I personally wouldn't for a variety of reasons that I get into in the book. Uh, but, um, and, and by the way, I'm not like anti-extraterrestrial water. I, I actually think that'd be really cool if it was, mm-hmm. if it was proven to be true. Um, but at the same time, the extreme lack of evidence that, that pushes this agenda even more forward, like, well, there's evidence to show that there's water on this exoplanet. It's within the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. Uh, so it's more likely that uh, extraterrestrial life could exist. 
not really. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's 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 again, it's it's a really big conclusion drawn on very little evidence. One of the <laughs> things that I find so so interesting about the idea of the chaos dragon being mm -hmm. in the sea is that there comes a point when a new heaven and earth is created, but the sea is no more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole point is that uh, the the idea that life might exist somewhere gets back to the. Uh, fact that uh, in the world of the Bible, which mm -hmm. came out of the Mesopotamian cultures uh, of the ancient Near East, all of the stories featured a warrior god that had to defeat uh, chaos represented by the sea and a serpent or a dragon that lived in the sea or rep represented the sea. You'd find this in Babylonian, the Enuma Elish, which yep. uh, Josh summarizes in the book. The Baal cycle. Uh, the mm -hmm. Baal cycle. Uh, but of course in the Bible, Genesis 1 verse 2, we see uh, the spirit of God hovering over the deep, mm -hmm. and the word translated deep is the uh, is the word uh, uh, tehom, which comes from, it's a cognate, same word, different language, from the Akkadian temtum, which was uh, essentially the name of the, the Sumerian chaos dragon, Tiamat. So uh, it, it's, it, and as Josh points out in the book, uh, Unlike the stories from the Baal cycle or Marduk defeating, and, and again, it's either Marduk or Ninurta or Enlil, depending on who's telling the story, or Enki, mm -hmm. um, where they defeat the Chaos Dragon, but only with difficulty and with outside help. I mean, Ninurta's got a, a, a mace that actually <laughs> is like a radio to Enlil, who's giving him instructions. Mm -hmm. uh, Baal has to have magic clubs developed by the, uh, the, the craftsman god. Uh, <laughs> Yahweh is just like, boom, Done spirit deal. hovering ah, over the, drop. that's it, <laughs> yeah. Uh, heads of Leviathan crushed, but, while it's been defeated, it's not dead. And the actual ultimate defeat of chaos will occur at the end of time, Revelation mm -hmm. 21. New heaven, new earth, and the sea is no more. It's a separate line. Mm -hmm. And in other words, chaos will be, be, be defeated. One of the points that we make in the book is that the, uh, the whole Crowley, Cthulhu, chaos connection is that Crowley's successor, Kenneth Grant, took the magical system developed by Crowley, who believed he was instituting the Eon of Horus, one of the Egyptian gods, mm -hmm. the Aeneid, um, and he said, uh, Grant said he detected a set serious current. Well, set was another version of this chaos monster, god of chaos, Egyptian god of chaos, equated by the Greeks with their chaos dragon, Typhon, who had to be defeated by Zeus, mm -hmm. um, and so he believed that we were now moving into the Eon of Set, or Eon of Typhon, the, the, the age of chaos, as it were. So he believed that this god of chaos was what was returning one of these extraterrestrial gods from outer space that's returning and that we better figure out how to deal with it because it might get bad if we don't. Now, so as Christians, are we scared? Should we be frightened by this? No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And Amen. God has already seen the, end, seen the end from the beginning. Book of Revelation revealed to John, hey, sea is no more. Ultimately, we'll be defeated. Um, but this is what the occultists believe. Mm -hmm. This is what they are acting on. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, more prominent occultists of the last 50 years, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, retired mm -hmm. from the U.S. Yes. Army, high security clearance, founded the Temple Don't of Set. set. Mm -hmm. Right, so the God of Chaos is the God of these occultists. And if we go back to the Crowley, Cthulhu, ancient aliens connection, it's that occult undercurrent that basically inspired the entire ancient aliens hypothesis that is so prominent in UFO circles today. Yeah, there's something definitely weird going on with the Leviath Leviathan stuff. Uh, and it, it, there, there's a really deep connection that we couldn't get into fully in the interview, uh, but we do in the book. So I suggest you check it out, The Day the Earth Stands Still. In a recent story, there's been a strange UFO sighting. NASA satellite snaps an alien spacecraft that's supposedly bigger than Earth and uh, they found this thing near the sun. So an alien UFO, and, and you can kind of see it in this video here, uh, Earth-sized craft spotted near sun, claims expert. So you can, you, can see, you can see it here. But it says, an alien UFO has been photographed by a NASA satellite orbiting in the sun, a self-styled ET expert has outlandishly announced. Um, so 
It says the NASA Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO mission, is the U.S. Space Agency's method for learning about the sun's structure and solar atmosphere since it began orbiting our star more than two decades ago. The NASA Space Telescope has made innumerable breakthroughs from understanding the sun's violent solar storms to monitoring its powerful magnetic fields. However, UFO hunter Scott Waring believes NASA SOHO has now made its most amazing discovery yet, spotting a huge alien spacecraft flying close to the star. Waring took to his etdatabase.com UFO blog to speculate about the dubious find. He wrote, quote, At first I thought the anomaly was just sort, some sort of magma or solar material ejected from the sun, but it doesn't look like it. The object's shape looks, just looks too perfect for that. There seems to be right angles to it, resembling a modern-day arrowhead. There are just too many right angles present for it to be a naturally occurring object, uh, end quote. Uh, so Waring proceeds to zoom out of the NASA image taken on July 24th, 2019, to get a better perspective of the solar anomaly, and it's right here. Uh, so you can, you, can see, you can see this zoomed-in version here. Now, I guess, I guess you could sort of make out a shape of an arrowhead, but you got to keep in mind, this thing, whatever this is, is 10 times the size of the Earth. Any right angle that what we might be seeing at this, uh, on this very small representation probably isn't as right of an angle as we might expect if we were actually to see it full size. Just like, you know, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. You know, we have mountains, we have valleys. Uh, but if you, if you look at the Earth from... Uh, from space, you know, from far away from space, like say from the moon or something, it, it looks perfectly sphere, just like the moon looks pretty spherical. Uh, but then when you look closer, you see a lot of craters and valleys and things like that. Uh, so here's, here's a picture where you can see, you can kind of see it right there. It says, this was taken from Soho's EIT-195 camera, which presents the sun with a greenish filter. Knowing the sun's radius to be 690 5,510 kilometers, the alien life conspiracy theorist estimates the UFO to be at least 10 times the size of the Earth, and Waring thinks that constructing such enormous spaceship would be easily feasible for technologically advanced alien cultures. He wrote, quote, imagine you are an alien and you want to build an object bigger than uh, planet Earth. So again, the, these supposed discoveries happen quite often. You know, there, there's a lot of times where you know, somebody finds something on Mars or somebody finds some weird anomaly on the moon. And I, I'm not discounting any of this. It, it's just we don't have enough information to really go on to know what these things are. Uh, do I believe that this is an actual constructed spacecraft flying near the sun that's 10 times the size of the Earth? No, I don't have a reason to believe that. I don't, that being said, I have no clue what it is. Uh, I, I, ha I have no clue. This could even be uh, a piece of extra dimensional matter that is uh, that, 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 that's kind of poking through our dimension. You know, there, there's a lot of things it could be, or it could be just a very strange, oddly shaped solar flare that had a picture of itself. You know, it had a picture taken of it at just the right time where it has these odd shapes. Yeah, I, we don't we don't really know. Uh, we can't really say for sure. Uh, but. Dr. Michael Heiser and I talked about UFOs in a 5 and 10 episode with Derek Gilbert because there is a mystery to this whole UFO question. What should we be thinking about them? What are they? Uh, and, and according to the available evidence, what conclusions can we draw? Here's a clip from that interview. Watch this. I think that primarily what we're dealing with are, are, is not hoaxes, uh, is not a misidentification of meteorological phenomena, things like that. I do tend to believe, and I think there's a really good circumstantial case to be made, that most of the time what people see is some sort of experimental craft. It's really part of the military-industrial complex, which takes you into not only national politics in this country, but also geopolitics, especially in the Cold War. And all of that, again, is, is demonstrable. It's fairly understandable. Uh, but there, there are sort of these cases on the periphery that don't quite you know, line up with all of that, that, that there's, there's just something that that explanation as fairly comprehensive as it might be just doesn't quite cover. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I do leave on the table some sort of spiritual component, but even if everything was a human experimental craft, I would still look at the issue the same way because this is a, a subject that we know from the document you know, evidence, you, official documents, not the ones that get leaked and, you know, become part of a conspiracy, but the real ones, that 
there were people, again, uh, you know, connected in high places in the government that, that saw the idea, the mythology, as it were, of aliens and extraterrestrials and an alien visitation, a very useful tool in terms of not only propaganda and disinformation, mm -hmm. but again, even, even more sinister areas about how to manipulate the thinking of a population. Well, when I, when I come across things like that, it, to me it's a very easy sort of connection to make with, well, if, if people are really doing this, could there be something even bigger behind it? In other words, could there be a, a connection to a supernatural intelligence that would want people to make other people think this, do that, behave a certain way. And so the facade and the portent really sort of runs the gamut. It, it allows the reader to think about all of the diff different buckets that this could fit into, but prodding them with the question of, on the one hand, our Christian faith could sustain a, an extraterrestrial reality, like a genuine one. But mm -hmm. what's really a bigger problem is taking this subject and manipulating populations with it. Mm -hmm. And we could say, well, that people are doing that. Okay, I'm, I'm not arguing that. But what I'm asking people to think about is what's prompting those people to do that? And I think in some cases you can build a, a pretty good uh, case, a circumstantial case, that there's really something more deeply sinister, more occultish that's really behind a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Now, Josh, uh, one of the uh, aspects of the ancient aliens hypothesis is that um, when the prophets of the Old Testament were looking at miraculous events, uh, the chariots of fire that Elijah saw, or the wheel that opens up the book of Ezekiel, mm -hmm. or, or the things that appear to be like wheels, uh, invariably, the hosts of these programs will point to those and say, well, they just didn't know what they were looking at. Clearly, these were spacecraft, and they were dealing with aliens. Um, in Cherubim Chariots, you address some of those things. For example, Ezekiel's wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are those things really or what was it? Well, it, it, even that answer kind of varies. Uh, the word is ophan, and and you know making that plural would be ophanim in uh, Hebrew. And I'm not I'm, I'm not a Hebrew. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but <laughs> that's, that's how, okay. You got one sitting to your left. <laughs> exactly. So we're okay. yeah. You're good. So. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> that's how it looks in English. So you know I'm a, I'm an American. I'll just mispronounce it. But uh, <laughs> but w when you actually look at the description, and this is actually something that uh, Mike Heiser's uh, covered extensively, well before I even got into it. But uh, when you look at the words that are used, there are words that could be used for things like, like one of the one of the big things that you know ancient aliens will say. Well, the the eyes around the rims of the the wheels, you know, those are probably windows or portholes or something. Mm -hmm. You know, why wouldn't they just say window? I, there there's words for that in Hebrew, and I actually I put them in that book to to show like Ezekiel could have just said this, and it would have made a lot more sense. <laughs> um, now. There have been that there's there's sort of an underlying assumption on the part of us 21st century uh, readers of this text written, you know, what 2,500, 2,600 years ago yeah. that Ezekiel was clearly just too primitive and stupid to know what he was seeing. And then if that's the case, then the whole message is lost. Like if it was aliens and they came to you know came to Ezekiel and wanted to tell him something, well clearly they failed because he got the wrong message. He thought it was God <laughs> and he thought it was you know angels and you know so clearly the aliens Oops, screwed we up. accidentally started a whole religion. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. what a big waste of time. So like it just doesn't it holds no water. What makes a lot more sense is that Ezekiel didn't see things the way that we see them today. He didn't see things through a 21st century American materialistic scientific world. Um, he, he, he was in a completely different area of the world, completely different time, you know, 2,600 years ago, completely different situation. And, and the things that he saw would have actually had a completely different meaning to him at the time in Babylonian captivity, um, because actually the things he saw was common in, in, in that area, uh, than how we read it today. Now, some people have looked, you know, other, other scholars throughout time have looked at that and said that, well, the Ophanim are a class of angel, and mm -hmm. it very well could be. I mean, it even says that the spirits of the, the cherubim were in the wheels as well. I know in Jewish angelology, Jewish angelology they consider the Ophanim to be a class of, uh, of angel. Yeah, right? yeah, and it, and it likely is. And, and, you know, of course, the wheels show up in other places like Daniel, and, um, and the cherubim themselves, they show up in and other places all throughout Scripture and in, in, in uh, Revelation. All right, so it's something that we're going to have to keep our eyes on, like I've said uh, throughout this episode, like I've said before. We're going to have to keep our eyes on all of these things, uh, and 
one of the best ways to keep up to date on this stuff is just by following into the multiverse. Uh, follow Skywatch TV. You can check out Justin Fall and Wes Fall's new film, Higher Entities, in which they did, uh, they recently did three or four interviews for Skywatch TV on that. So you can go find those. Uh, but we just have to keep our eyes on all the available information on this. Uh, and again, like I said before, keep your eyes on Israel because I believe that this does connect with historical events in Israel. I believe that we've uh, at least, if not proven, I believe that we uh, were able to offer a lot of evidence towards that conclusion in me and Derek Gilbert's book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. So you should check that out, check out higher entities, uh, and if you could, if you haven't had a chance to already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and click the bell for notifications. If YouTube does not notify you, that's okay. Just know every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Central, you will get a new episode of Into the Multiverse. All right, everybody, this has been a lot of fun. And until next time, thank you so much for watching. Take care and God bless. When did the government alien programs originate and why? Who were the Collins elite and were they exposing the dangers of such programs? What exactly did these black projects involve? Learn the astonishing answers to those questions and so much more. Skywatch TV is proud to announce the Higher Entities Ultra Collection. This special offer includes the new Fall Brothers feature film, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes, which is a live action documentary including up close and personal discussions with former FBI agents, Department of Defense consultants, best-selling authors, and seasoned research professionals that deliver intimate testimonies of disclosure, which put you face to face on location and in the conversation, featuring Justin Fall, Dr. Thomas Horn, Ray Boucher, Derek Gilbert, Stan Dale, Darren Geisinger, Chad Riley, and Wes Fall. But that's not all. You'll also receive the top secret five volume DVD collection, Project Stargate. This unprecedented series of never before released confidential interviews features 12 of the world's leading authorities on UFOs, so-called aliens, gods, and the coming day of contact. You'll be amazed as we go behind the scenes to ask experts what they really believe is coming. Watch as men with security clearances like the late Dr. Chuck Missler share for the first time what they know. Then take notes as Dr. Michael Heiser, the late Chris Putnam, Russ Dizdar, Joe Jordan, L.A. Marzulli, Daryl Sims, Gary Stearman, Joyce Ahrens and others as they weigh in on what will soon cause the world to stand still in awe. Project Stargate holds a retail value all by itself of $150, included now for a limited time in the Higher Entities Ultra Collection. Sold separately, this Ultra Collection holds a retail value of $175, yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So take advantage of this incredible offer now and receive all five Project Stargate DVDs along with the new Higher Entities documentary for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. Now at the Skywatch TV store, order the Higher Entities Ultra Collection online or call 1-844-750-4985.